Good morning and welcome to the latest Japan Society webinar. I am Yuchiro Nakajima, a trustee and director of the Japan Society, and it is my pleasure to be hosting today's session. I apologize to anyone who was expecting to see Bill Emmett and hear his dulcet tones. Even though there are certain similarities in appearance between us, Bill is by some distance the better chairman and I would like to record my thanks to him for giving me the opportunity to moderate this event. The subject matter today may be somewhat off piste for the Japan Society, but a relevant and interesting one nonetheless. One of Abe Shinzo's policy priorities while he was in office as prime minister was to promote the idea of womenomics, encouraging greater involvement in the labor market by women in a bid to spur the growth of the Japanese economy. While the jury may still be out regarding its success or otherwise, Womenomics certainly made the issue of greater female participation in economic activity a topic of discussion and a policy target. It also prompted a larger debate on diversity in Japanese society in general. In the world of sports, the sensational rise of Naomi Osaka captured the imagination of the country and her Haitian Japanese background generated a certain amount of talk about what it means to be Japanese. Although she's by no means the first mixed heritage Japanese athlete to enjoy major success. And now we know that Japanese football authorities have plans to launch a fully professional women's football league in 2021 to be called We League, WE standing for Women's Empowerment. You may recall that Japan's national team won the 2011 Women's World Cup in Germany, which made Nadeshko the moniker by which the uh, team is known, a household name in Japan and elsewhere. Japan Football Association's stated objective is to make the We League one that offers the best football, provides the most active female community and represents the greatest value in the world. Women's football in England had its first golden age just over 100 years ago, with matches attracting large crowds. However, the Football Association initiated the ban in 1921, which disallowed women from playing football on the pitches used by its member clubs. This ban remained in place until as recently as 1971. Some say that the FA was jealous of the support the women's game enjoyed and felt threatened. It apologized for this ban in 2008. England is now host to the Women's Super League, Europe's only fully professional league. Last year, WSL agreed a three-year sponsorship deal with Barclays Bank, which is thought to be worth in excess of 10 million pounds, with a prize money pot of 500,000 pounds for the league champions. This was described by the FA as the biggest ever investment in UK women's sport by a brand. It is also known that the, FIFA, uh, that the FA is negotiating a TV contract which would cover both free-to-air and pay-per-view formats. In many respects, WSL leads the professional game in the world, along with the National Women's Soccer League in the US. Today, we're fortunate to have the opportunity to listen to the views of two leaders of the women's game from Japan and England. Kiko Okajima Murray is the inaugural chair of the Wii League. Kiko lives in Maryland, but today she joins us from Tokyo, where she is leading the process of selecting the teams that will be admitted to the Wii League when it launches next year. And in fact, just before we came on air, she was telling us that the selection process has finished, but she has declined the opportunity to tell us who <laughs> those teams are. A former national team member herself, Kiko has had a long career in football as a player and administrator as well as a su successful banker at various institutions, most recently at Merrill Lynch. A recent article featuring Kiko has listed her priorities as building a fan base with lots of women and girls rather than older males, making the game, uh, game self-financing, embracing social issues such as LGBTQ rights and finding sponsors. Kelly Simmons, MBE, is director of the Women's Fo Professional Game at the Football Association. Having captained Warwick University's women's football team, K 
Kelly also has had a long involvement with football administration, especially in developing the women's game at a national level, for which she was made an MBE in 2001 and was awarded the BT Sport Industry Leadership in Sports Award in 2016. In her current role, Kelly has the challenge of ensuring the continued success of the WSL, despite the pandemic and all that entails. She says she's a big fan of Nadishko's style of play. And indeed, the business viability of the women's game, its role as a catalyst for social change, and how the professional game influences younger players to consider football as a career choice, may all be subjects that England has a lot to teach Japan about. I will now ask each of our panelists to give her thoughts on these matters. They will each speak for 10 minutes. After that, we will take questions from the floor. Please use Zoom's Q&A fun function at the top or bottom of your screen to send in your questions, and I will try to get as many of them answered as possible uh, within the given time. Now, Kelly, if I may ask you to kick off this session, and uh, I will then ask Kiko to follow up. Thank you. Okay, thank you, and good morning, everybody. Um, it's great to be here. I'm conscious that there are some people on the call who know a lot about the Women's Super League and women's football in England and some who won't, will know very little. So I'll try and give a, a quick overview and, uh, and then obviously in the, in the questions we can dig into any topics that you want to know in more detail. Before I start, I want to say congratulations Kiko and Japanese FA on your projects. Really exciting. Can't wait to see how your league develops. Um, we're always learning from the Japanese FA and, and as you as you said in the intro, I'm a big, big fan uh, of a uh, Japanese women's team and, and who isn't in the world? They play a wonderful style of football. So really looking forward to seeing how, how that develops and, and good luck with everything. So I came into my role two years ago. Um, I was previously director of development for the FA, predominantly focusing around um, children's football and, and grassroots football and, and all the challenges um, that that uh, gave. But I, I couldn't turn down this opportunity. I really thought... Um, that coming in to develop the women's professional game, it, it, that the women's football could be the breakthrough sport in terms of women's team sport and that regular visibility uh, and commercial viability. Um, that if any, any sport could do it, um, women's football could. We'd seen uh, women's sport in this country that those sort of big pinnacle moments, you know, there were big audiences and big profile, World Cups, European Championships, Olympics, but nobody had really broken through into the mainstream uh, regular coverage but I was actually convinced um, that, that women's football could do it and we owe it to girls uh, and women and to society um, to get that get visibility and profile um, and what I think inspires us every day all of us who are working in in the clubs uh, and in the federation and with our stakeholders is that this generation of girls can be can, be, can become professional footballers like boys could and, and that's hugely hugely important for us uh, and focuses the mind every day. Um, so Quickly, sort of in terms of an overview, um, the Women's Super League is the top of our structure. We've got a whole pyramid of women's football, right down from local football all the way through to the top. It's connected through a women's pyramid. We run the first four tiers of that uh, in the Football Federation. So the Women's Super League, the Women's Championship, which is semi-professional, um, and then the Women's National League, which is a really big league with some huge clubs in there. Um, that provide a wonderful football opportunities in their community and, and some have aspirations to come through and play semi-professional and professional football. And the strength of that pyramid is, is hugely important to, to the women's game. And we have to remember as we're developing the top of the pyramid that we've got to keep developing all of it so you don't end up accidentally with a closed league because you haven't got those clubs able to, to flourish and come through. So, uh, so we run the top four um, tiers of that. In 2018... We made the decision that the Women's Super League would become fully professional. The way we did that was through our license criteria. We've got um, you know, significant kind of licensing that underpins the, the Women's Super League, which really sets the standards um, of the pitch in, in every aspect. And what we did there um, was really to dictate the contact time of players as well as the uh, conditions around elite performance services, the coaching, etc. the whole wraparound of making sure it's a professional uh, elite performance environment and, and clubs had to meet those standards to get into the Women's Super League. And so from there on in, that top league now uh, is fully professional. We thought that was hugely important for a couple of reasons. You know, one, uh, obviously, as, a, as the English FA, we want England to do well. 
and therefore uh, our players in a full-time competition program, uh, full-time athletes playing against teams who week in, week out are training full-time can only help support the success uh, of our national team. And then also, you know, the quality of the product. So, you know, I remember a few years ago when the women's game was pretty much amateur and it was getting compared to the men's game, yet these women were working, training two or three times a week, um, giving up their holidays to play uh, and then getting compared to the men's game, top of the men's game, uh, in terms of quality of the product for, the, for men who had been had had elite programs from a very young young age and were fully professional. In terms of the quality of the product, it's absolutely vital that we provide everything that we can to, to make those players uh, excel and we have a quality pipeline of talent coming through. So in terms of the quality of the product and therefore being able to commercialise it, we thought it was hugely important for it to be professional as well. So those are the sort of the drivers behind why we went fully professional in 2018. Mm -hmm. Now, we couldn't have done that, obviously, without the club's uh, in the Premier League, uh, in the English Football League predominantly, who are helping to fund professional football. So the game isn't currently sustainable in its own right. Uh, and I'll talk about the work that we're doing to, to make that happen. But, um, you know, it was obviously um, significantly reliant on, on investment uh, and support uh, and the passion from the from clubs who, who believe in our vision. Um, and what we're trying to do both for women's football and in society. So, you know, a huge thanks to them who've, who've helped make that happen. Um, when I came in, um, we agreed sort of early on um, as a senior management team, what our sort of priorities were that we thought were going to help really transform the game. We put a new strategic board in, uh, Women's Super League and Championship board with some fantastic uh, senior club people working really collaboratively with them around how we drive the league forward with some excellent independent people with expertise uh, in elite performance, in, the com in commercial, in broadcast, et cetera. So a really strong board to help drive that league forward, both with the Federation and with the clubs, which is really key. We've developed uh, a five-year strategy to grow um, the leagues and develop them. And that's based around a focus around um, three key areas for us, attracting and developing world-class talent, um, and we can talk a little bit maybe about that, that in the questions, um, but obviously a youth pipeline is fundamentally important in that, as is the ability for clubs to attract top players, but also space for English talent and, and the policies that underpin that. Um, we've got uh, the, the second one being our ambitions around growing attendances. That is obviously on hold at the moment. We're playing behind closed doors here because of COVID. But pre-COVID, um, we'd worked really hard on the calendar, putting our biggest games in the best slots, utilising men's stadia, uh, really focusing around how we market those games, really understanding our audience, detailed insight into who's most likely to attend, really understanding our fans. We've driven attendances up on an average from just under 1,000 to 3,000 uh, in six months. Um, but unfortunately, obviously, you weren't able to continue that work. Uh, due to COVID, but hopefully when we get fans back, we can continue on that. Um, and then, you know, our third ambition is around growing revenue so that we can make the game sustainable and that we don't have to rely on whether men's football clubs and, and men's owners um, want to back uh, the women's game. We've seen clubs, women's clubs collapse uh, as a result of that. And so it's really vital for the long-term sustainability and health that we grow revenue in the women's game. Um, we've obviously, you've mentioned already, in the intro, we brought Barclays in, um, in a three-year partnership as title sponsor. It's great to see the clubs either signing partners specifically for the women's game or clear attributable value in joint, partners, joint commercial partners um, coming in to the club. So we're seeing more commercial revenue coming in, even in the times of COVID, um, we've seen, you know, we've signed uh, recently Vitality as our partner for the Women's FA Cup and the clubs are signing deals as well, which I think shows the strength and the potential of women's football that brands are getting involved, even when it's a really tough market out there. We also uh, work with Pitch International to sell our overseas rights. So we want to take the WSL globally, we want to grow global audiences, we want to support our clubs um, to help raise their presence and vis visibility abroad. We're in a number of territories across the world. We've used pitch to help sell those. Probably our biggest deal is NBC uh, in the USA, um, which gives us a huge potential audience out there. But uh, we're in a number of territories across the world and, and increasing um, uh, with a number of sort of deals 
coming in still. So, um, so that's been really pleasing. Um, it's been interesting actually because there've been very little benchmarks around um, to know, you know, when, when the board rightly say to you, is that a good deal? And you try to look for benchmarks in women's sport, there often aren't, uh, are very little there around women's team sport audiences and, and, and revenues, but um, it, we're, we're pleased with, with the progress that's made. And, and as mentioned, we're currently out in the domestic market for, uh, in terms of our ITT, and we hope to have announcements in the next few weeks around our domestic rights, where our ambitions are to grow revenue and, and hugely importantly, to, to grow audiences and get more eyeballs on the game. So, um, so that's sort of what we've um, focused on. Uh, probably be remiss of me not to quickly mention COVID. Uh, we had to terminate last season. We've come back strongly with Community Shield. Uh, Three million people watch that either live or through the joint, uh, joint highlights. Uh, we've had some fantastic record-breaking numbers in terms of our BBC women's football show since we've come back. We've been completing the Women's FA Cup uh, that gives us a chance as well, BBC One, BBC Two coverage, um, which delivers big numbers for us, as we know, obviously having a number of games on BT Sport as well. And there's two this weekend um, coming up. So, um, so we've been really pleased with how we've been able to come back. Obviously, you know, our focus now is to get fans back. We don't truly know what the impact of COVID will be uh, in the market. Um, we don't know when fans can come back. It would be naive to say that there won't be further bumps in the road, but so far we, you know, we've come back strongly and, we, and we're really pleased with how we've come back. Just to wrap up really quickly, I think for us, sort of some of the success factors, I think, and learnings um, for us in terms of the Women's Super League um, would be that I think the licensing really does help drive consistency of standards uh, that underpin everything that, that you want to do. I think that has been really important. Um, having a really strong board uh, and a collaborative approach is fundamental as you know the federation cannot do this without the clubs you know the clubs are the most important uh, aspects of that they're huge so working collaboratively collaboratively with them is really really important um, and everything is about the quality of the product as we go out there to build audiences build build interest and, um, uh, and take the game to more people so everything that wraps around that youth talent and first team and giving those players the chance to be the, the very best that they can be is, is absolutely essential. So that's my, my intro. I um, hope that gives us sort of a flavour of, of what we're doing and, and our priorities and uh, I'll hand back and look forward to the questions. Thank you very much, Kelly. Um, you've made some very interesting points and uh, particularly stressed the importance of the commercial viability uh, of the game, um, that it uh, can self um, sustain itself um, through gate receipts and not reliant, not being reliant on the men's gains investments and so on. I think that uh, that uh, has uh, a lot of um, uh, implication. I mean, th those lessons are very relevant to Japan, I'm sure, uh, about which uh, I would now like to ask Kiko to, uh, to talk. I would like to first thank Japan um, Society in London to have the, this opportunity to be the speaker and to meet with Kelly Simmons online. There are much to learn from the FA in the development of women's football, especially from FA Super League, since Japan will, um, as Yuichiro said, will launch the first women's professional league in September 2021. It is called We League. We stand for uh, women's empowerment and the league advocates increasing women's participation in decision-making in many levels. Um, actually, I just finished the fourth selection committee meetings hour and a half ago and decided initial clubs. The committee had a very good discussions and um, it was a very difficult decision, but uh, we came to the decision and we'll announce the teams, the clubs, initial clubs um, next week. Um, I just wanted to talk about the, um, my experience in football I, um, because I experienced a very frustrating uh, period of uh, women's football in Japan. I started to play when I was um, only boys play football. When I was 12 years old, I joined um, middle school boys team and started to practice. 
since I could not play in matches, I started to look for a women's team and joined the first women's club team in Japan. The number of the teams in Japan at that time were probably around 10. But we started to have matches and started the regional leagues. Um, we were strongest team. Um, so in 1978, when I was in high school, my club team participate, participated in Asian Ladies Invitational Tournament in Taiwan. And Japan Football Association did not recognize female players at that time. Therefore, we paid our own airfare and our uniform has a flag, national flag in arms, not the in front. Um, then I realized all other countries like Australia, Hong Kong, Taiwan, um, Singapore, Malaysia, all these countries have a national teams. They sent the national teams to the tournament and their uniform has the country flag on the chest. That is when I decided to work on, on Japan Football Association to recognize women and have a national teams. So with the help of many men, since I was a high school student at that time, I managed to convince Football Association started uh, registration of women in 1979. So fast forward, Japan won the World Cup in 2011, and now Japan Football Association supports the start of professional league um, in 2021. And I became the initial uh, chair of the league. Well, Japan currently has amateur league called Nadeshko League in three divisions. We lead will be the um, totally separate league sitting on top of the uh, structure. We league requires clubs to have minimum of 15 professional players with five top players of uh, making 5 million yen, which is about 36,400 pounds. Season is the same as Europe, fall to spring. So we league, as well as the uh, Super League, has to somewhat rely on men's professional team's investment. Um, out of 17 teams apply to, um, for consideration, only eight teams are part of the men's league. And other teams are supported by corporate sponsors. So corporate sponsors are um, key to clubs and also at the league. Um, and, and then um, it's very important, obviously, to have the fans. So my first um, goal for the first year is to have at least 5,000 spectators on average. Um, if the league has a good number of spectators, the clubs have higher revenue and will be easier to gain corporate sponsorship. The league cannot be successful unless stadiums full. There, um, and then. I'm thinking about three different types of fans I'm targeting. The first, I would really like to bring young football players, especially girls, to the stadium. Cur currently, Nadeshko League average spectator is about uh, 1,300, and the majority is mid aged men. Um, main reason why the young players cannot come to the game is their own matches. Since land spaces are limited in Japan, the number of stadiums limited, and there's little flexibility in game scheduling time for girls. Therefore, we league has to be flexible in scheduling um, our games, such as maybe having the late afternoon games on weekend or Friday evening games. The young girls cannot come to the stadium on their own that means parents or coaches will come with the um, young girls, increasing the number of fans. The second, the league will target young women, especially if we've ne never been to soccer games. So uh, in order to attract those um, new fans, the league is thinking about um, each stadium to be like a festival with food trucks, vegetable cart, 
um, craft tenders and even mammography vehicle, for example. Um, third, um, I would like to bring anime and comic fans to the stadium. There's a popular girls soccer comic um, and its anime will start in February next year. So it's a perfect timing for the Wii League. The league will collaborate with the uh, anime and comic by producing um, products only available on the stadium, on, at the stadium. So I'm hoping to have at least like 500 um, to 1,000 um, anime fans actually come to that uh, stadium. So in terms of um, increasing women in decision-making levels in Japan society, which is predominantly uh, male-dominated society, <clears throat> the league will start um, with our own football clubs. The league requires to have at least one woman in management staff. Um, and 50% um, of the women in um, like coaches um, and like trainers and other staff. Um, that actually means that um, women's football players after they um, retire can have a, a position in their club teams. And um, in, in addition to being a coaches, so Japan Football Association started high level coaches training program um, catered only to women. And um, we, uh, Japan Football Association also starts a female leadership program for uh, local football association um, management and uh, we lead clubs. So we're hoping to um, be that the league itself will be sustainable and the club will be successful in attracting fans. Um, and then also um, we'd like to send the messages to um, Japan society that women um, can be in the management level, can be in um, decision-making. And then also like to um, send a message to include different like diversity, um, including uh, LGBTQ community. So I'm hoping to hear questions about the We League um, and uh, Japan's women's soccer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kiko. Uh, that was uh, that was very interesting, and um, uh, I hope that there will indeed be a lot of questions about how you intend to. Um, to, to run the league when it gets going. There are a few that's already come in and I'm, I might just take, uh, pick up some of them. Um, and this, I guess, is um, directed more towards Kelly. Um, Andrew Main, who is a longstanding member, says, I'm a governor of an independent boarding school who are launching in September 21, rather like the Wee League a girls football program supported by a Premier League foundation for its development. What advice could you give us to develop individuals which are unique to uh, soccer? Kelly, would you have anything to um, say about this? Advice for launching uh, girls football in schools? Well, I mean, first of all, it's brilliant that you're doing it. Um, we've got an ambition. We've got a new women's football strategy coming out later this month. There's an ambition in there that every girl who wants to play football should have access to football in schools. And that's part of our partnership with Barclays as well, because they're really passionate about giving girls the opportunity all the way through to the Women's Super League. So it's wonderful to hear. Um, and I think, um, and I'm sure that the coaches and teachers and people involved in delivering the sessions um, we'll do this anyway, but the research and insight shows um, that, you know, that girls um, are looking for, you know, fun, creating a fun environment is really important, um, helping them develop skills. Um, they'll all come probably at different points and in, in different opportunities from having no opportunity um, through to 
playing uh, in formal football or maybe having had opportunities uh, in, in younger years in school. So there could be a range of, of, of abilities. Um, so helping them to develop those sort of basic skills and techniques, have fun. You know, they love the whole sort of fun and friendship piece from the inside. So it's creating a really, you know, supportive, um, positive uh, environment and encouraging encouraging and supporting those girls to, to, to learn those skills and ultimately you know, have those for life, whether they want to go on and play competitive football or fun recreational football. Yeah, but, but good luck with it. And mm -hmm. there's lots of uh, support on, on the FA's website for coaches and teachers. So um, there's lots of help there and advice. Okay, thank you. Um, I would like to, there are more questions uh, coming in and I, I will pick them up, but I'd, I'd like to um, ask one of my own, which is about leadership. Um, Kiko mentioned that there'll be at least one uh, female um, uh, involved in the decision-making process at, at every level. And that seems a fairly modest ambition. Um, I would have thought that you might want to have the majority of um, decisions taken by, sorry, uh, decisions taken by a majority female uh, decision-making bodies. But um, maybe that's just the initial ambition of uh, the JFA and the WE League. What has been FA's uh, experience in involving or, or in getting decisions taken by uh, female leaders. Has that been very important or uh, is, uh, is, is that not so such a key part of your um, consideration of how you run the WSL? Uh, yeah, no, it's very, it's very important. And um, the football bodies are about to launch an equality code, which talks really sort of pushes home or asks clubs to commit to and sign up uh, across the board to greater diversity in terms of its senior management teams and its coaching, both in terms of gender uh, and ethnic diversity. Um, I think uh, we've seen when um, a few years ago when the WSL was first created and those management jobs, coaching jobs were became full time, um, we saw predominantly that they were taken by men and it was really concerning, but we've worked really hard with the clubs to identify talented female coaches to support players who've come into the end of their career that want to go into coaching alongside our partnership, mm -hmm. uh, the PFA, which is the uh, players union here in this country, um, to support players to get their quali coaching qualifications. And now actually the majority um, of coaches in the Women's Super League uh, are female. So um, sort of gone over the 50% target and, and, and women are the majority um, and obviously we've got to keep that work and um, our, our lead on women's uh, coach education Audrey Cooper's um, constantly supporting and, and developing courses and content and, and working with coaches to to make sure that female coaches are coming through and that next generation are coming through and that's really really important I think in terms of the women's clubs as they're becoming more integrated into the overall club I mean that's first of all that's hugely important strategically for the development of the women's game that um, the, the clubs are, and those who are most successful are sort of integrated and embedding embedded in the overall club and we're seeing um, women start to take senior leadership positions uh, I mean, there are women in senior leadership positions in those clubs anyway just generally uh, in, in different roles and um, but we're seeing people like um, Enya Luko, came, who's come in as sporting director of Villa, taking, um, you know, sitting on the senior leadership teams of clubs, driving yeah. the women's club forward, and I sort of urge clubs, you know, to, do, to who haven't done that yet, you know, to really think um, about where their women's football club sits, um, and that they've got a you know seat on the table, uh, and that they've got a balance, a gender balance um, in that as well. Okay, thank you very much. Um, uh, Bill Emmett, who is chairman, uh, he's listening to this somewhere in a comfortable chair, I hope. He asks, um, thank you for two very interesting presentations. What response has there been, or do you foresee, from mainstream Japanese media, Kiko-san, both print and TV? Uh, so if, if you could address that, Kiko-san, and then Kelly, do you have any advice on how to encourage and deepen media coverage of women's football. So Kiko first, please. Um, so you asking about the um, media coverage or future media coverage? Well, what, what, uh, media what, cover what response have you received from oh, mainstream okay. Japanese media so far? Uh, and what, what level of uh, interest do you foresee in future, both print okay. and TV? 
So the um, media coverage initially when I uh, joined, uh, well, when I announced that I became a chair of the league was pretty good. Um, the, not just a, um, like a sports media, like mainstream um, TV, not TV station, mainstream um, uh, national level uh, newspapers mm -hmm. like Asahi and Nippon, um, it's like equivalent of Financial Times, um, covered pretty large uh, article. And as they were kind of focusing on um, my business side because in Japan, it's very difficult to, for um, women to have professional career and um, raise children. I have a, two kids who's 23, 26, and then I raise them while I'm working. So um, some like Financial Times equivalent media is interested in um, how I manage their uh, career versus family. Um, and obviously the we league the professional league is um you know interest of certain way but um my background as a former football player um kind of left that football um business side or you know the, just i was basically focusing on financial um career myself uh, for probably 20, 30 years, and then came back to um, help the We League. Mm -hmm. So their um, focusing was more on, um, you know, like a process of um, developing the Korea, and then now I'm trying to bring my um, experience into um, the We League management. So um, we hope to. Um, be covered by my business side as well, because those type of news appears on the corporate sponsors' mm -hmm. eyes. Mm -hmm. the, you know, the management of the corporate sponsors will be that um, like business newspaper, not just a um, you know sports paper. Yes. So um, we're hoping to uh, send a message from um, to attract those type of media. Right, that's, that's very interesting. And I'm sure you're right. Um, uh, the business press would be interested in your backstory as well, yes. Um, and uh, Kelly, your thoughts? Uh, around media coverage and how, yeah. how we get more, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that's one of the things that's really changed in the last couple of years. There's been a sort of a, a movement, a sort of a pushback in this country um, around the total domination of men's sport uh, in our newspapers. And I think, um, women's football's reaped, you know, the benefits, I suppose, of, of that sort of demand for, for more coverage of women's sport and, um, and the fact that we've got the Women's Professional League and a quality product um, and big clubs and, and great players and all those things has really helped to, um, to get more coverage of women's football. Most of, I think all of the newspapers actually um, have got um, foot, women's football writers um, who are delivering great coverage of the women's game. So, you know, it's our job as a league, to, you know, to have, you know, regular... Um, briefings with the media um, to get across what we're doing um, to make sure um, pre-season we have a couple of days where all the clubs you know the clubs are in their players some of their players are in we're giving lots of content um, to help launch the league and, and feed those stories through um, as, as the weeks progress so access obviously is really really important and 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 that's you know a key role for the clubs as well that they've got communications lead that they're giving access to the manager and the players that they're helping. Um, often, you know, they want, people want to know about the players, they want their backstory, they want to know, you know, that they've got some incredible stories of, of battling through to become a professional women's footballer and, um, and people want to know about that. So that access is really, really key. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it was, um, you know, during COVID when we didn't have uh, any football on, you know, it was a tough narrative as we were under a pile of, protocol rules trying to work out how to come back I was desperate to get the game back to the journalists to start you know talking about football and not and not the, uh, the the lack of women's sport and the lack of women's football so um it's great you know that we're back we've got um some great games on some, yeah. some yeah. great players and, and and we're back they're back you know covering covering the football yeah yeah and of course you've got Alex Morgan joining Tottenham mm -hmm. from the United States I'm sure yes. that's, that's a big news item as that's well. a big story here yeah. yeah 
Yeah, okay. Yeah. We have a question from a former football uh, professional, footballer, Moya Dodd of Australia. Uh, she um, has been long in, uh, uh, involved in FIFA, AFC, and FFA, uh, and uh, now a lawyer, but still very active in the uh, football uh, world in many respects. She asks, will the JFA fund the WE League and be involved in its governance? Is the J League involved directly in governing the Women's League or indirectly, collaborat co uh, co collaboratively, if, for example, in fixture, um, fixturing, fixturing and double headers, or only via its clubs? So I guess this is a question for Kiko about the, the degree of involvement um, by JFA in the WE League and how the J League teams are going to work with the WE League teams. Okay, the JFA um, will provide 300 million yen. I don't know how much is in pounds. About, about um, $3 million, so about $2.3 million um, sterling. Sterling, um, $2.3 million sterling initially for the first year. And then uh, over the next four years, um, 800 million yen. So it's quite... Um, large sum of money and we obviously um, league is trying to find um, corporate sponsors and the two firms two corporate sponsors are already secured um, although we cannot really provide the names yet but um, we also trying to find that um, the title sponsor still um, the um, the J League teams will collaborate in a different ways, not just the, all the teams in the same way. Um, some teams have the same management and the um, some J-League team will have a separate women's uh, organization and they fund um, that organization, but the management will be totally separate. Um, other teams have a um, like same management and then um, I think they share um, share the uh, um, stadium and share some coaches, but um, so it's a, depending on the team. But um, the J League chairman, Mr. Murai, um, is supportive of uh, women's uh, We League, and I asked to have that double headers um, because some stadium management do not like the double headers because that you know if, if women's play first their uh, condition of this um, field will be not, not going to be you know, perfect but um, Mr. Murai um, agreed to have the double headers in at least like two three times a year so I'm, I'm counting on that mm -hmm. and that will be pretty huge because J League is very popular and um, like the fans of the J League to have opportunity to watch women's uh, football and see how interesting those uh, women's games are. Yeah, that, yes, that's that's a great idea. Yeah. Thank you, um, uh, Helen, Mac Dr. Helen McNaughton of uh, SOAS, who is a member of the society and uh, is a director uh, in financial and management studies at uh, at the university asks a threefold question. She's managed to get in, get three in. Um, first one addressed to Kelly, uh, who mentioned that she liked the uh, Nadeshko's style of play. I think that's what you said to me. Um, and she asked, what is that style? So I will let you think about that. Uh, and second part is, are there any current, uh, current corporate sponsors for the Nadeshko Amateur League in Japan. Is a, a, the Nadeshko League being sponsored by any corporates? Third is, what is the name of the popular manga that is being launched at the, uh, as an anime next year? So Kelly, perhaps you can address the style of play that you mentioned. <laughs> yes, sure. I mean, I know, I know there's other people on here who are big fans of their, of, uh, their style of play. But for me, we always used to joke, when we, we've, when we were playing them, um, 
you know, not to give the ball away cheaply because it could take you 10 minutes to get it back because they're just, keep, you know, they're technically excellent. Keep the ball really well and pass and move. And it just, yeah, it's just it's beautiful to watch a lovely style of football. And I know that, you know, I've got friends across the world who, who work in women's football and I don't know anybody who isn't a fan of play. Mm. So uh, it's great That's to good. watch. That's very good. Thank you. Uh, Kiko, the uh, sponsors yeah. and anime? the corporate sponsors currently um, cosmetic company. Um, it's not the mainline cosmetic company. It's relatively like a um, lower price um, cosmetic company. Basically, is the owner of one club. Um, the other co big corporate sponsors, uh, Consumer Electric um, Distributor. Um, they're mainly um, in in that uh, um, Tokyo near Tokyo area. Um, Who are these and, companies? Can you can you give the names? Our, na our names. Uh, Chifure is the oh, cosmetic Chifure. company. Yeah, Chifure. Mm -hmm. uh, Nojima is the consumer electric distributor. Yeah. Um, and there. Um, some J League teams also, uh, women's J League women's team also have a pretty large um, corporate sponsors like Kameda Seika, which is yeah. um, rice cracker company. Yes. yes. Um, yeah. So um, each clubs have, you know, very pretty large number of small sponsors, corporate sponsors in the local level. Um, and those could be like, um, travel agent, the real estate company. Oh, one of the uh, companies also real estate company owns one of the women's teams. Um, so they each clubs um, work on finding more smaller corporate sponsors to um, like each different level, like uh, uniform sponsors, um, you know, training wear sponsors, that kind of things. Yeah, okay. And the name of um, the anime is um, goodbye my Kramer. So that Kramer means Detmar Kramer, who's a German uh, coaches coach who came to Japan and started the uh, formal training program for the coaches. So um, that is becoming um, that uh, comic was very very popular. So um, now they're um, one of the um, movie company starting, they're creating a movie based on that anime and then TV program will start February, uh, no, April next year. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, we've got a few more questions to address and I'll just fire them off. Um, Richard Parkinson asks, what are the views of Kelly and Kiko on player development as it relates to girls playing with boys? Um, the overload principle of player evolution is a strong argument for girls playing with and against boys for as long as possible. Is this part of their play, player development policies, both at academy and national team levels? And to what age is it encouraged and also allowed? It's an interesting question because um, it touches upon uh, a lot of um, issues, in not, 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 uh, 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 including um, uh, safeguarding and so on, but perhaps um, Kelly, do, do, what what are your what are your thoughts on this? Big fan, big fan of girls uh, who want to play uh, mixed football um, and got yeah uh, want to play to play it because it will you know it's tough, it's competitive, it'll be physical, um, it's it's a great development for for the players. We we encourage it. We see more and more girls playing in. What we'd call mixed teams, but I suppose predominantly boys' teams in grassroots football. Um, we, uh, in our academies, uh, youth sections, um, in, the, the girls are playing against um, boys' teams and in boys' leagues. Um, mm. And we think that's a really good stretch for their development. And we play uh, mixed football up, up to under 18. And I think you have to look at Germany, where they've played mixed football for longer at a higher age, the sorts of players they've produced and the success they've had. When you say mixed football, is that boys against girls or boys and girls in the same team? Well, grassroots, um, 
you, you'd call it mixed because a girl could come along and play in the team as kind of boy. Um, but obviously, you, you get girls only teams where girls are more comfortable playing girls football. But um, if they're playing because the volume of boys football, if they're playing in in mixed teams, it's predominantly you know one or two girls um, yeah. in boys teams. Um, okay. In, in the academies, it will be a girls team versus a boys team as part of that stretch uh, in terms of their development and, and a competition program. Okay, thank you. Okay, and Kiko, what, what's Japan's experience? You played um, football when there were very, very few girls' teams, so you, you probably have personal experience of having to, having to play against boys or uh, no, not so much needing to or wanting to. What, what, uh, what's the policy in Japan now? Um, the po policy is, actually, I'm not really sure about the policy, but um, the many Nadeshiko um, Japan players, national team players, has started to play among boys. So yeah. they, um, you know, their skill level was kind of trained by um, playing against boys. So I am, um, again, not sure about the current policy, but one professional football player called Nagasato, she just announced to um, play in men's team. Yep. So he, he's became a part of the men's team player in Japan. And that's a big news because um, she, she was a national team player and then she plays a professionally in the United States and she decided to play in the professional, um, also I think a J3, Division three um, professional league in Japan. Yeah, that's, that's Yuki, Yuki Nagasato. Yes. Yeah, 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 okay. So, uh, okay, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, there are a few more questions. We've got a, a little bit more time. So if I can just carry on asking questions. Um, about uh, the establishment of Wheelie, uh, it was, it depended on the support of many men. Uh, and Janet Hunter, who uh, is a longstanding member of the society asks, I wonder how far there was a, a generational or other divide in male support for the establishment of the We League. Um, how much support, uh, did, you know, the men, men had to be involved, but uh, was there any sort of difference in views on the establishment of We Leagues between the older and younger uh, men? So Japan Football Association obviously have, has to support the, um, the women's um, soccer, women's football. And that is because, you know, FIFA really um, advocates women's uh, games and um, to develop in each country. And Japan Football Association obviously predominantly male, um, but some of the men who really um, support that um, we league believes that um, women's soccer, women's, I'm sorry, I'm just keep, keep, keep saying soccer, women's <laughs> football um, can become um, successful, especially after 2011, um, Japan national team, women's national team won the World Cup. And it, it's probably very difficult for men's, um, Japan's men's national team to win that World Cup, um, as you can probably see. Um, but it's um, women's teams is still didn't do, do well last uh, the World Cup. It still ranks um, 11th in the in the world. So um, and then also um, in terms of spectators, fans women, there's a lot more room for to grow for women um, to become a fan. So um, I think that many men um, bets on successful uh, launch in We League mm -hmm. in Japan. Okay, Ke Kelly, can I ask you um, the, the same question about male support for the WSL? Um, uh, is, is, do, do you know what the sort of um, gender divide is in terms of the supporters? Yeah, yeah, um, a male skew. So if you look at um, 
audiences, more men watch women's sport than women. Um, and that's the same in football. So um, I know my fan base um, that is increasingly engaging with the women's game is 16 to 34 year olds. Obviously we target young girls as well for all those sort of inspirational uh, reasons. Um, but uh, 16 to 34, and that's a male skew as well. So uh, yeah, uh, it's a, those male, male fans uh, and male allies that are helping drive the game forward are key. Mm, okay, well, that's interesting. And I and uh, that's, um, as, as uh, former FIFA president Zeb Blatter once said, women, you know, women should wear shorter shorts and tighter tops to make the game more attractive to men. I mean, I hope that is not the case, um, that, and that's not why men watch uh, more men watch football. Because I hope that it's because the game is more exciting, and uh, and there's more uh, room for development, and and for the right reasons. But this leads me to ask uh, one of my own question, which is uh, one of my own questions, which is what? Um, how do you think football or professional football in particular can drive or encourage social change in terms of female participation in uh, the workplace, in terms of um, uh, pay equality, in terms of uh, sort of harassment and uh, safeguarding issues. I mean, I don't know, it doesn't matter what, what you pick, but uh, I'm just curious to see as administrators of the uh, of a professional, in other words, a a, a uh, uh, work um, type of work, how do you think think the type that uh, the job that you're pro providing encourages these changes in society? Maybe perhaps um, uh, Kiko, you might want to start. Okay, um, what um, I am planning to do is to invite the corporate. Uh, sponsor female um, uh, employees of the corporate sponsors to that um, really game and then have an um, opportunity to meet each other and then opportunity to talk to each other. Um, sometimes in um, female um, employees in the same company may not be able to share the um, problems in they encounter in the workplace. But if they go to, if you, um, they meet with um, other female colleagues in a different companies, they may be able to share that experience and um, kind of bring us um, solutions to um, progress in their career in their own com uh, company. So that's one of the things. And, and then we try to, to send a message, um, don't really know how, but we, um, we try to send the message to the society that women can um, do this. Women can participate in decision-making and become a successful. So I, um, one of the reasons why the Japan Football Association wanted me to um, be the chair um, is because I, became successful in men's dominated um, financial um, company um, in the United States as a Japanese female. So um, I'm hoping to share my experience in um, many different ways, um, like a seminars or, you know, like speeches and a different, um, different opportunity. So I try to be um, visible in many different ways. Okay, thank you. Kelly, what, what, what might be your thoughts? Yeah, well, we, we talk a lot um, at work about, you know, the higher purpose uh, of what we're trying to do and, and that's around the empowerment of, of girls and women in society. And, you know, for, for many years, you know, girls expected to do certain things, boys do certain things, that played out hugely in sport. You know, mm. Girls to play netball and football wasn't a girls' mm. sport. Rugby wasn't, and basically anything visible, really. Um, and any of our big national sports but weren't deemed suitable for girls, um, which I remember as a young girl finding ridiculous and incredibly frustrating. Um, but I think the visibility of women's football now and those fantastic role models sends a really powerful message that girls can do anything um, and that you can be healthy and strong mm -hmm. uh, and 
fit and athletic and you can enjoy team sports and all the benefits that we know and all the confidence and the leadership skills yeah. and teamwork and everything that those of us who love sport know um, has given to so many more boys than girls over the years and and and, and we're fighting back so um so yeah it's um it's hugely powerful i think sends a hugely powerful message right. in about girls and women and 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 that that inspires us every day very good very good well, I note that uh, we're, we're out of time now, um, so I would probably have to uh, wrap up the session and uh, thank uh, Kelly Simmons, Kiko Okajima Murray for taking part in this panel, uh, the uh, webinar. I'd like to thank everybody who asked questions and I'm sorry that there are three questions that I could not uh, bring on board, but uh, uh, I hope you forgive me for that. We were. Uh, you know, there were lots to talk about and we're out of time. Um, thank you for joining us. And um, I wish the WE League every success and the WSL continued success. And thank look you. forward to seeing you uh, somewhere in uh, on the pitch, uh, on TV, wherever. And, uh, uh, but for now, uh, I would like to uh, finish this uh, webinar. Thank you very much for joining and see you again next week when we have another uh, Japan Society webinar. Many thanks indeed.